while <clears throat> things are, are going quite wild in the U.S., uh, Extinction Rebellion is <clears throat> still at work in London. Police are making arrests in Parliament Square, issuing 100-pound fines for totally legal, socially spaced action in defense of our planet and all living things. So I guess there was just a recent action uh, yesterday. <clears throat> oh, I'm not showing you guys this. I'm sorry. So there was a socially distanced space Extinction Rebellion action yesterday and some people were arrested <clears throat> and some people were ticketed um, anyways just wanted to show you that and other uh, extreme temperature news <coughs> excuse me in Phoenix uh, at 2.30 a.m., it was 93 degrees. How is that for a daytime low? <laughs> Looking at past data, this may be the warmest it's ever been between 2 and 3 a.m. in the month of May. That is insane. That is absolutely brutal. 93 degrees at 2 in the morning. Uh, I don't, you know... There's not much else to say about that other than, uh, crikey. And let's move on to, <clears throat> if you all know who Matt Taibbi is, um, he works for Rolling Stone. He's on the podcast, Useful Idiots, um, does a lot of good work. And he wrote an article about the censoring of planet of the humans, planet of the censoring humans. So let's look at this a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing, but we'll read a little bit into it. The campaign to remove Michael Moore's new documentary from the Internet led by Moore's erstwhile progressive allies is a significant advance in the censorship revolution. We've been talking about this. Re censorship is on the rise and this can only mean bad things because when you think it's okay to censor someone else, then you're saying it's okay to censor you. Try to try to keep that in mind. On April 21st, 2020, just before the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day, Oscar-winning director and producer Michael Moore released a new movie called Planet of the Humans, directed by Jeff Gibbs. The film is a searing look at the ostensible failures of the environmental movement to which Moore and Gibbs both Belonged. I don't know why he said past tense there, um, but whatever. I guess he's just saying in the past they had belonged to the movement. Jeff and I were at the first Earth Day celebrations, more laughs. That's how old we are. Distributed for free on YouTube, the film's central argument is that the environmentalist movement, fattened by corporate donations, has become seduced by an industrialist delusion. Uh, say it ain't so. The whole idea of the film was to ask a question after 50 years of the environmentalist movement, how are we doing, recounts Moore. It looks like not very well. And that's the, I think that's the main, the main thrust of it. And I get it. I get that people might be upset that, you know, people in the environmentalist movement that might be upset that you're calling out the failure of the environmentalist movement. You know, because people are out there working and trying and doing and we're all trying, you know, but you know, if you if you're looking at the raw data, if you're looking at just the absolute the absoluteness of the reality of where we are in respects to climate change and how much progress has been made, then that's the reality. We, we we're not doing enough. Um Kim says, Matt's great. He lives in my neighborhood in JC. JC, sorry, where is JC? I don't know what, I don't know what JC means. Anyways, let's go back to the article. <clears throat> um, uh, 
Moore and Gibbs challenged the idea that both the planet and humankind's current patterns of industrial production can be saved through the magic bullet of renewable energy. The film shows lurid examples of various deceptions, like the oft-used trick of replacing coal plants with new natural gas plants, which are then called clean or green, or the hideous trend of describing the burning of trees as a renewable energy source. <clears throat> Environmentalists denounce the film as riddled with lies and misinformation, claiming, among, among other things, that Moore used old data to discredit green technology. A campaign to remove the film from circulation immediately took shape. Within 24 hours of it going on to YouTube, people got to work on trying to take the film down, explains Moore. He immediately started hearing about emails denouncing the film that were being circulated to what seemed like everyone on the left. Oh, where did these emails come from? An action letter composed by environmentalist Josh Fox was circulated describing the film as dangerous, misleading, and destructive demanding an immediate retraction. Films for Action, an online archive of progressive movies, initially bent to Fox's demands by taking the film out of its library, only to put it back up a half day later out of a desire to avoid a messy debate about censorship. Oh, those messy debates. You try rubbing, you try scrubbing. An intense campaign of editorials followed, and roughly a month later, YouTube actually removed the film. The platform cited a four-second piece of footage shot by filmmaker Toby Smith that supposedly was a copyright infringement. Moore, who says all his films are heavily lawyered, insists the footage was legal under fair use laws. I'm sure they wouldn't have put it out if they thought somebody was going to have a problem. And I believe uh, the film had something like 8 million views when they took it down. So a lot of people were watching it. I'm sure they were really upset about it. Um, so again, this also underpins my argument that, you know, to conspiracy theorists that think that climate change is a hoax, um, I don't know. It's, it's just really sloppy and lazy, I think, to think that or to go along with that one because there isn't a lot of evidence supporting that theory. But the other thing that I would have to say is that well, the other thing that I do say is that climate change is not, the, the conspiracy is not that climate change is a hoax. The conspiracy is that climate change is much worse than they're, they're letting you know. It's much, much worse than they're telling you. And so, you know, on, on many levels, Planet of the Humans is telling people that climate change is much, much worse, um, that things are not going well. They're, they're, they're showing you very starkly that things are not going well in the environmental movement and that all these lovely things that we're trying to put into place, you know, renewables and green new deals and blah, blah, blues that they, these are all just supporting the capitalist system that is destroying the environment, right? They're showing that they're laying that bare. And so the, the, the establishment, which is trying to keep you, um, sucking down, the idea that climate change is real, but you know we're tackling, we're on the case, we're doing something about it. This is the Paris Agreement and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, they really want you to believe that that climate change is real, but golly, 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 gosh, gee whiz, we're doing something about it. Um, and but what they're saying is we're not doing enough, and they don't want you to know that. Um, So in many, in one of the many ironies, fair use laws have long been celebrated by progressives and it, as an invaluable tool for journalists and artists. So anyways, they, they use the footage under the fair use laws. The significance of the Moore incident is that it shows that a long developing pattern of deletions and removals is expanding. Um, my, the other thought on this film uh, that I would also like to point out is that... Um, if it's so bad, why are they why are they going to such lengths to uh, you know have all these disagreeing points of view being put forward and trying to delete the film and trying to censor it and trying to take it down? And I mean, there's there is a lot of outcry around this, and I feel like the level of outcry kind of shows you that maybe they're maybe they're over the target. Maybe that's the problem with the film. There, maybe there's too much truth. 
The removal of a film by Moore, a heavily credentialed figure, long revered by the liberal mainstream, takes place amid a dramatic acceleration of such speech suppressing suppression incidents, many connected to the coronavirus disaster. And then, and then there's that. A pair of California doctors were taken off YouTube for declaring stay-at-home measures unnecessary. Right-wing British broadcaster and trumpet, uh, trumpeter of shape-shifting reptile theories David Icke was taken off YouTube. If you got, have you guys heard of that? Um, I heard he was, his YouTube channel was deleted. A video by Rockefeller University uh, epidemi uh, epidemiologist Newt Witnowski was taken down, apparently for advocating a herd immunity approach to combating the virus. This is insane. Golly gee, we can't have any we can't have any dissenting ideas. You know, or or else it's the end, or else people will be you know put in harm's way. These moves all came after a popular libertarian site, Zero Hedge, was banned from Twitter ostensibly for suggesting a Chinese scientist in Wuhan was responsible for the coronavirus. But then you know after that, CNN and all kinds of other channels, uh, I mean. Outlets, <clears throat> Washington Post, also said, hmm, it might have come from Wuhan or from a lab. But that, that was after Zero Hedge was already banned. In late April, the World Socialist website, which has been one of the few consistent critics of internet censorship and algorithmic manipulation, was removed by Reddit from the coronavirus subreddit on the grounds that it was not reliable. The site was also removed from the whitelist for our politics. The primary driver of traffic from Reddit to the site. Then, in early May, at least 52 Palestinian activists and journalists were removed from Facebook for not following community standards, parts of a years-long pattern of removals made in cooperation with who? The Israeli government. So, guess, are you seeing what's happening here, guys? If you allow censorship of one person, it can be used on many people, and that that people might be you, eventually. On May 13th, human rights activist Jennifer Zeng noted that YouTube was automatically deleting Chinese language refer references to terms insulting to the Chinese government, like Gong Fei or Communist Bandit. Ooh, I just said it. Oops. <laughs> um, congressional candidate Shahid Buttar complained in an interview with Walker Bragman about Democrats supporting surveillance powers was removed by YouTube. Whoa. Whoa. So you can't, you can't talk about Democrats supporting surveillance powers. Wow. Um, Evan Greer of the speech advocacy group Fight for the Future had a post flagged by Facebook's independent fact checkers. In this case... That noted pillar of factuality, USA Today, dinging him for a partly false claim that the Senate had voted to allow warrantless searches, searches of browsing history. That's actually totally true. They did allow that. These and many other incidents came in addition to a slew of move, moves aimed at right-wing speakers accused of varying degrees of conspiratorial misinformation and or hate speech from a decision by Twitter to begin fact checks of Donald Trump to wholesale removals from Facebook of anti-immigrant sites like VDARE and UNS Review. One problem is that the so-called reputable fact-checking authorities many platforms are relying upon have terrible factual histories. Um, case in point. Case in point. Uh, they fact-check a Donald Trump tweet about mail-in balloting, he, he tweeted something about mail-in ballots, you know, leading to voter fraud, and they fact-checked that tweet as false. The thing is, is that it's actually, the data indicates that it's true, <laughs> that mail-in ballots actually are rejected at a higher rate than in-person ballots, and there seems to be, there's, there's more incidences of uh, fraudulent behavior or, you know, Etc. with mail-in ballots. So you may not like Don Donald Trump. You may think he's a piece of shit. But he actually that was actually truth that he was saying in his tweet. And so they fact-checked him. 
incorrectly. The fact check was false. Let's fact check the fact check. The fact check was false. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't determine truth as anti anything that Trump says. And that's how people are, are determining what the truth is now, which is insane. Anything that Trump says, you know, is, is lies. So anything opposite of what Trump says is the truth. That's insane. Uh, for whatever reason, guys, I even have the door open and I have no stream, of course, because, because something, something, something. Hold on one second. Okay, I'm back. I had to restart my stream. Sorry. J Thadcast, rejection is voter suppression, not fraud. Well, I agree with you. It's the same as, you know, not counting provisional ba ballots, which is a form of voter suppression. I agree with you. Um, however, there was, there was an element in the study that they were referencing uh, that there is some element of fraud involved. So, you know, whatever. Anyways, let's keep going, because this is an interesting article. I hope you all are enjoying it. Um, let's see. Well, and the other, the other instance is that, you know, uh, Donald Trump is trying to fight against censor censorship on Twitter, maybe for the wrong reasons, but he's actually right. And so, you know, there's there are a few cases when you can actually count on Donald Trump to say the truth a few um, but if you're basing again if you're basing your your value on truth as anything anti what Donald Trump is saying or doing um, you're a bit of an idiot because you're not actually using your brain um, a lot of what he does say, say and does uh, is full of shit but you know you got to think it through you got to actually check it out on a case-by-case -case basis basis um, Blah, 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 where are we? One problem is that so-called reputable fact-checking authorities many platforms are relying upon have terrible factual histories themselves. Exactly. Snopes is for dopes. Just remember that. There's an implication that misinformation by foreign or independent actors is somehow more dangerous than broadly disseminated official deceptions about U.S. misbehavior abroad or manufactured scandals like Russiagate. We now expect libertarian or socialist pages to be zapped at any minute, but none of the outlets which amplified the bogus steel dossier have been put on internet timeout. Exactly. So when CNN gets it wrong, or MSNBC, or or major, you know, or even Fox News, if they get it wrong, they're not sanctioned, they're not fact checked, they're not deleted, they're not censored. So there's a bit of a um, an imbalance as to how this is, you know, how, how punishment is meted out. Moreover, despite wide, widespread propaganda to the contrary, the new movement is to regulate speech on platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube is actually censorship. In the United States, high-ranking politicians of both parties have held congressional hearings and threatened these tech companies with tighter regulation and taxation if they do not develop policies for combating the fomenting of discord. Uh-huh. And in other words, you know, no dissent allowed. Thank you. In response, these companies, which as recently as four or five years ago, were disavowing editorial responsibilities in the case of Facebook going as far as to deny being a media company at all, are now instituting vast new controls. It's a clear symbiosis. 
Governments permit mining of lucrative markets in exchange for access to the platform's monitoring powers. That censor censorship, says Andre Damon of the World Socialist website, that's a First Amendment issue. Throughout the last four years, it's mainly been left to people affected by these new policies to point out the obvious that relying on star chambers of corporate gatekeepers to oversee information flow will have dramatic consequences. These voices seem to be the only ones interested in sticking up for the rights of political opponents. I don't think anyone can confuse me for a supporter of Donald Trump, but I see the danger of celebrating of uh, Twitter fact-checking him because that's going to be the model for all of us, says Ali Ab uh, Abumina, author and co-founder of the Electronic Intifada, which has extensively covered the suppression of speech in Palestine by Facebook, including the recent removals. It's always presented as we're going to crack down on white supremacists and anti-vaxxers, says Damon. But the practical impact of speech controls is always to advance the interests of the ruling class. And again, yes, they, you know, the very simple uh, correlation between putting up Donald Trump as the Antichrist or whatever, you know, the, the boogeyman and saying like, it's, you know, we've got to shut him up is really effective because it makes a lot of people go, yeah, let's do it. Um, not realizing that they're signing their own, their own censorship uh, laws against themselves. The uh, pseudonymous editor of Zero Hedge, Tyler Durden, points out that even when plant platform bans of sites like his are reported by mainstream press outlets, Reporters rarely address the underlying rights issue. Nobody really digs into the First Amendment angle, he says. They're going after the far right. They're going after the middle right. They're going after the far left and the middle left. Where does it end? We already have a clear picture of what the end game of public-private cont content regulation partnerships might look like through the experience of other countries. In a, an extreme example, as far back as 2016, Israel's Justice Minister boasted that Facebook was complying with 95% of its requests for content regulation, deleting thousands of posts by Palestinians. Palestine is often the canary in the coal mine on speech issues, laments Abu, uh, Abu, uh, Abunima, or Abu Nina, Nima sorry, in Germany, which has strict hate speech laws. Main, Facebook maintains an archipelago of ominously named deletion centers with as many as 1,200 employees at a single site to sift through content in search of community standards violations. Under pressure from politicians and pundits alike, platforms began moving in this direction in the U.S. few years ago with Facebook announcing mass hires of employees with Orwellian titles like community re reviewers and news credibility specialists. The drive to step up, up content control isn't all driven from the top down. A major additional factor has been the growth of a new intellectual movement geared toward delegitimizing speech and rationalizing censorship. The Moore incident provided a clear demonstration of how this new social reflex works. <coughs> and this is, you know, all under the guise of like political correctness, right? Um... In Planet of the Humans, Moore and Gibbs make a complex argument. In, SSA, in essence, they charge that people have become dependent upon a high-consumption lifestyle made possible by fossil fuels, and that it's our addiction to the way of life, that way of life, as much as fossil fuels themselves, that is driving humanity off a cliff. Their core criticism is aimed at big-name environmental leaders like Bill McKibben and Robert F. Kennedy, Junior, whom Gibbs and Moore argue have de-emphasized this truth to sell a fantasy profitable, uh, profitable equally to industry and environmental movements that we can innovate our way to survival. As is usually the case with Moore movies, Planet of the Humans across, came across as a case for the, for the prosecution. Whether he's denouncing George W. Bush or the healthcare industry, Moore always sails close to the wind factually and often leaves out mitigating information a traditional journalist would feel obligated to include. This movie is no different. For instance, audiences are not told 
until the credits that McKibben, who is depicted on film celebrating the beauty of burning wood chips, actually eventually came out against biomass plants. It's easy to see why McKibben would be upset at the portrayal of him in the center of an argument that the environmental movement has overstressed the possibilities of, of renewable energy at the expense of changing consumption patterns. After all, he's written, written books and given talks addressing that problem. Then again, most of the criticism of, of McKibben comes in the form of footage of him talking. And liberal audiences never had a problem previously when Moore declined to add humanizing context to unflattering tape of Don, you know, the Don Rumsfelds and Charlton Hestons of the world. Moore's movies have always been designed to get gut punch audience, to gut punch audiences, and his M.O. is being unafraid to be uh, to be accused of being unfair when he's warning of disasters in Iraq, of a future of normalized mass shootings, of a failure to address working class issues. He correctly predicted would lead to electoral victory by Donald Trump, etc. He's a provocateur who dares opponents to call him out on the facts. Here he is musing about a $10,000 reward for anyone who can find errors in Fahrenheit 9-11. Planet of the Humans features all of these tactics that simultaneously made traditional journalists nervous but earned pl plaudits among committed liberals. One gets the sense that more... His skin, leather thick after years of media battles, is intentionally provoking a backlash in an effort to kickstart what he feels is a debate. People are running out of time to have. Ding, ding, ding. Um, I don't know if I can read this whole article, guys, because I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to go on and on. But I, it's such a good article that I was enjoying reading it. Um... I'm going to stop it right there. So I didn't, I wasn't intending to read the whole thing, but I just wanted to draw your attention to it. You can find this article by Matt Taibbi. The, um, the title is planet of the censoring humans. And I hope you enjoyed me reading a bit of it there. Um, where are we at in the numbers guys? Anybody, anybody? I know you want me to keep going, but I, I don't have time to read the whole thing. It's long. And I wanted to cover some other some other stories. But yes, I wanna leave I wanna stop at the there's no more you know, there's little time for the the debate. Chris Lye says there is no more time for the debate. There is only time for action. Right. Uh creative experiments, more calling out Democrats allying allying with billionaires for green projects is not depopulation. 71 watching, very good. Thank you. All right. Cool, cool. Thanks for the numbers, guys. I don't know if it's at Rolling Stone. I think it's um I think it's at his own site. He has his own website, his own blog. Taibi at st Substack not at taibi.substack.com that's that's his site um yeah it is a good article um i encourage you to read the rest um let's move on to some other news more heat waves um happening in Siberia, uh, parts of U.S. and India. This is from yesterday. A heat wave will send temperatures in some parts of the U.S. to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the next few days. Scorching temperatures also hit parts of India as well as Siberia this week, raising concerns over devastating wildfires in the Arctic region this summer. 2019 was the ho second hottest year ever capping off the hottest decade in the recorded history as Earth grapples with accelerating climate change. But they're not grappling very well, right? Um, you know, we, we're, we're really mad about the fact that U.S. didn't grapple with coronavirus quite strongly enough. Um, 
and everybody is up in arms about this Michael Moore movie. But what are we doing? You know, what kind of emergency measures are we taking around climate change? What kind of, you know, crazy, insane shutting down of the economy measures are we taking around climate change? We are not. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Man, my stream is just terrible today. It's making it very difficult to actually get through this. Uh, maybe it'll come back. Um, parts of the U.S. are under excessive heat warnings as a heat wave threatens to send temperatures into triple digits over the next few days. Uh, some states in the Northeast are already boiling. Burlington, Vermont will hit 95 degrees Fahrenheit this week. Good Lord. As well as upstate New York. In the West, cities including Phoenix, Fresno, and Las Vegas are under excessive heat warnings. I just read you something about Phoenix a little while ago with expected highs of more than 100 degrees. It's not just the U.S. facing staggering temperatures. Montreal on Wednesday had its second hottest day on record with temperatures reaching 98 degrees in Montreal. India is also struggling with scorching temperatures that reached 118 degrees in the capital New Delhi this week, 118 degrees, 122 degrees in Rajasthan, a state in northern India. The heat adds pressure on the country as it struggles to reopen during the coronavirus pandemic and faces a massive locust invasion. 2019 was the second hottest year ever, capping off the hottest decade in recorded history as Earth grapples with climate change. Six of the warmest years on record occurred during the past decade. Given the alarming rate of global warming, 2020 will likely be among the five hottest years on record, according to scientists from the National Centers for Environmental Information. Siberia, one of the coldest regions in the world, experienced record-breaking heat this week with highs reaching over 80 degrees versus the historic average of 59 degrees. Russia averaged nearly 11 degrees above average temperatures January to April this year, the largest anomaly ever seen in any country's national average during that time period, according to Berkeley Earth lead scientist Robert Rode. So it continues. Hey guys, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. You can also support the channel at the links below, PayPal, Square, and Patreon. Also, um, all of my live streams are available for listening on Patreon if you happen to miss them during the day. So um, you can sign up for my Patreon for as little as $8. If you want to go check out the live streams, they are all there. Thanks a lot.